Welcome to the Things Network webinar series. My name is Johan Stopping. I am tech lead of the Things Network, and this webinar is about security, the fundamentals in LoRaWAN, the enhancements in LoRaWAN 1.1, a multicast, joint servers, industrial deployments. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, I'll be addressing them on the forum after the webinar. Um, uh, for the details and the link, just uh, see the chat. So here's the agenda. Um, first, I'm going to talk about LoRa security fundamentals, uh, then the scope of security in LoRaWAN, a multicast, joint servers, uh, industrial LoRaWAN deployments, and finally, how we implement the security aspects in the Things Network stack. So first, a bit of difference between LoRa and LoRa 1 in terms of security. LoRa, just raw LoRa, LoRa 5, uh, is only a physical and data link layer. So it doesn't provide any security. It only gives you a CRC, which is essentially an indication whether uh, bits uh, were fallen during uh, transport. And most of the breaches uh, in, in LoRa solutions are actually end devices that only use LoRa 5, not LoRa WAN. Uh, but obviously you can also use LoRa WAN in a very wrong way. And uh, in this presentation, I try to give some tips on how to use LoRaWAN in a secure manner. So LoRaWAN provides a network, transport, session, and presentation layer mechanisms. And these all address security. So just a few of the foundations um, in security. It's authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality. And in LoRaWAN, the authenticity is um, provided in the network layer uh, by addressing and the message integrity check. And they also serve the integrity of the message. So there's a four byte device address, which is not unique, um, but it gives an indication of uh, which device it is. And then there is the message integrity check, which is a cryptographic verification uh, of the message. And only when the uh, server has the right uh, network session keys, uh, it can um, calculate and verify that it is that end device, so the authenticity that sent the message, but also that the payload of, if, of the message has not been tampered with. So that's the integrity. Finally, there is the confidentiality, and that is provided on both the net layer uh, through AES 128-bit uh, encryption in uh, ECB mode. In LoRaWAN, uh, there are two ways to activate your device. First is uh, over-the-air activation, and the second is activation by personalization. So in OTAA, there are new session keys on join, and in ABP, you have fixed keys. So over-the-air activation supports join through a join server, and the joint server holds the root keys. So um, the joint server can be a solution provider, it can be uh, the owner of the solution, but it can also be a trusted third party. Uh, if you use an operated network, um, you may use the joint server of the operated network, you may use your own joint server, uh, or you use a trusted third party that operates the joint server. Only the session keys are shared with the network operator. So the root keys are only in the joint server. Over the activation also supports a few new features in LoRaWAN 1.1, uh, rejoin, rekey, and handover roaming. Uh, there is a separate um, online webinar about new features in LoRaWAN 1.1. So if you know, want to know more about these features, then um, uh, please uh, watch that webinar as well. Uh, in ABP, um, you don't use a joint server because there is no joint procedure. Uh, it's a fixed keys and they cannot be changed. And the keys must be shared with the network operator. And that means that it's very hard to switch networks. Uh, and if you switch networks, it's also not very secure because you cannot change the keys. And finally, uh, ABP requires persistent memory in the end device uh, and in the network server. And that is uh, to maintain and uh, keep track of uh, frame counters. Um, and it means that if you have uh, memory loss in the end device due to a power cycle or 
um, uh, a firmware update, um, then it renders the device unusable. And finally, <coughs> um, it's, uh, it's best to use uh, over the air activation in, in any case, except uh, when you have very specific requirements uh, like resource constraints, when you uh, don't have downlink, for example, um, uh, which you need for, uh, for the join procedure. You need, the network needs to be able to send a join accept. So generally speaking, for secure solutions, always use over the air activation. Uh, LoRaWAN 1.1 in the backend interfaces um, specifies the network reference model. And the network reference model is a, is a very simple overview of uh, the end device, the gateway, um, the gateway communicating with the network server, uh, the joint server, uh, and the application server. And it's, it's very important to, to, to see the difference between these components because in many cases, I think a network server is often a, a monolith component, um, but um, it's it's good to look at these different roles because this is where uh, and how the keys are exchanged between these components. So let's dive a little bit into these keys and let's see uh, what the keys are uh, in LoRaWAN. So LoRaWAN 1.1 introduces a few more session keys. Um, and these are now functional session keys, so they really have a specific purpose. Uh, in the integrity, on the integrity side, we have a forwarding network session integrity key and a serving network, serve network session integrity key. Uh, and these are used to uh, calculate the message integrity check. Um, there's a, there are two keys here, the forwarding and the serving, uh, and that is to support um, roaming, where there is a forwarding network server that can already um, verify one part of the message integrity check and a surfing network server that can. Um, on the encryption, so regarding confidentiality, there is a network session encryption key that's being used to encrypt MAC commands, and there's an application session key that's used to encrypt application payload. So these four session keys. Uh, play an important role and, and have their own purpose in uh, LoRaWAN. Now these keys are symmetric. Um, so uh, these are AES 128-bit keys uh, and the network and the end device uh, use the same set of keys. The root keys, the app key and the network key um, that are in the end device and that normally don't change, they are shared with the joint server. The session keys, so the four session keys, uh, they are shared uh, between the end device and the network server, the application server, and also the joint server. The joint server keeps them. So the network session keys, the three network session keys uh, are shared between the end device and the network server, and the application session key is shared between the end device and the application server. The key derivation scheme in LoRaWAN, uh, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's, um, uh, th this, is a, this is a good overview that comes from the LoRaWAN specification. Um, if you wanna have a closer look at this uh, and also the different purposes of the keys, then uh, please um, look at the LoRaWAN 1.1 specification because it contains this uh, very nice overview as well as um, a good description. Besides, uh, the keys and encryption and integrity and um, uh, confidentiality, uh, there are a few other features um, related to security that LoRaWAN provides. First of all, we have the link check. And the link check allows an end device to determine whether there is a link available, uh, but also get information about um, how uh, the signal quality is and how many gateways are uh, covering the device. And this is important in case where an end device needs to know whether there is coverage, um, which uh, when, it's, when there's no coverage, it may uh, use another means of communication or um, uh, try again later uh, or um, have some user interface um, to a user to, um, <clears throat> to show that there is no uh, link available. So that's link check, it's part of the LoRaWAN uh, specification. 
there's also um, uh, confirmation of data messages. So uplink and downlink messages can be confirmed. And this is for end devices to ensure that um, uh, uplink messages were received by the network server uh, or from the downlink, uh, on the downlink side from the network server to get a confirmation from the end device that the downlink message was received. Uh, and this also supports at least once delivery. Because of course, um, you can also lose the acknowledgement, uh, in which case the device may retry to send the same message, uh, also confirmed, um, uh, just until the network responds with an acknowledgement. If it's really important to, uh, to, for a message to be, um, uh, to be received on the, on the network server. Third, there is uh, channel utilization optimization, and this works through adaptive data rate, or ADR, and that's a mechanism to reduce packet loss. And this also contributes to the security of a solution um, because um, a high packet loss can make um, solutions less secure, uh, depending on the use case. And finally, uh, there's a mechanism in LoRaWAN to detect uh, replay attacks, uh, replay can be both uh, the join and uh, data messages, so uplink and downlink. And these are things that are a bit enhanced in uh, LoRaWAN 1 um, uh, to detect these uh, uh, replay attacks. And uh, this is important uh, in, in many use cases because sometimes uplink messages uh, trigger uh, certain actions. And you don't want a uh, man in the middle attack to replay uh, some messages to trigger an action again or to bring a device in an invalid state. So I'm referring to LoRaWAN 1.1 a few times. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about what's new in LoRaWAN 1.1, please uh, watch this uh, webinar on uh, YouTube. So then um, the scope of the security. Uh, there's, there's quite some information that's public in LoRaWAN that just flies through the air. And when considering security in LoRaWAN and designing secure solutions, it's very important to be aware of the information that's transmitted through the air um, in, in, in the plane, in clear. So first of all, we have the join UI and the def UI um, that are uh, part of the join request. Uh, so when a network in over the activation, when a, when a device joins a network, um, it sends a, a join request and it contains uh, a join UI and a def UI, which are eight byte um, fields. And the join UI refers to a join server. So it also tells the attacker where the root keys are because the join server uh, handles the, um, the join procedure. And the DEF UI is a unique identifier of the end device. And um, it may also indicate the LoRaWAN module and the version, uh, or even the end device uh, brand and model that's being used. Because oftentimes the DEF UI relates to a batch of LoRaWAN modules uh, or a specific uh, device. Um, Next to the join UI and def UI, uh, other public information is the device address, which is a, um, a four byte device address, which is also reusable. So multiple devices can use the same device address. Um, and it indicates the LoRaWAN network because the first few bits, depending on the size of the network ID, uh, indicate uh, which LoRaWAN network is being used. Uh, there's a frame counter that is public, uh, the length of the application payload, so obviously not the application payload itself, but the length is public, as well as the port. Uh, and finally, uh, sometimes the MAC commands are also sent in the clear. So um, j just to give an example of what you can get out of this public information. So let's say um, uh, there is a parking lot monitoring solution. Um, based on the join requests that you can receive on any LoRaWAN gateway, uh, you can see um, the, the brand, the model, and the version of the parking sensor if the DEF UI relates to 
uh, a batch of uh, parking sensors. Also, the device addresses and the frame counters may indicate the network operator by the device address, but also an estimation of the number of parking sensors that are out there. Obviously, if you see a parking lot, you can also count the number of places, but this is just an example. Finally, uh, activity in the parking lot can also be, may also be derived. Uh, if um, uh, a parking sensor, for example, sends a message when a car moves, when, uh, when it arrives or when it leaves, um, and maybe the um, activity can also be derived from the payload length. So maybe uh, an arriving car results in four bytes payload and a leaving car in only one byte, for example. Uh, sometimes the, the port is being used, so for example port 1 for an arriving car and port 2 for a leaving car, and this is also public information. So it's just good to be aware of this um, uh, when deploying LoRaWAN solutions. So a few tips to mask uh, activity um, considering these public fields. First of all, uh, avoid using a dev UI that relates to an end device brand model and version. You can, um, you can always get a Mac block from the IEEE, uh, in which uh, guarantees unique um, uh, device UIs uh, that you can use for your devices. Second, uh, use a fixed payload length and uh, do not use the, the frame port, the F port, uh, as a sensitive data field. If you use a fixed payload length, you derive any information about the length of the payload, obviously, and if you use always the same port, um, uh, then you can't see any information, can't derive any information about the port that's being used. Another tip could be to consider uh, decoupling physical events, like um, a car that arrives or a car that leaves, from sending a message, so that um, the eavesdropper cannot um, estimate activity based on the number of messages or when messages uh, are being sent. So you can use Jitter, so you can use random delays uh, based on uh, physical events, uh, but you can also use just periodic status messages. So the next topic I want to talk about is multicast. Multicast is uh, a very powerful feature in LoRaWAN and it allows you to send downlink messages to multiple devices uh, at once. Uh, and this can be devices that are in class B or in class C mode. The way multicast works is that there, uh, there is one or more temporary multicast security context uh, next to the unicast security context. So the unicast security context is just the device address and the session keys that that particular end device has. And a multicast security context is a security context that is shared uh, between all the devices in the multicast group. So these devices, they use the same device address and the same session keys next to their unicast security context. And this also means, uh, in terms of security, that if one of those devices gets compromised, then the attacker has access to the session keys of the multicast group. Uh, and that means, because security is symmetric, that the attacker can also send downlink messages to the multicast group. Multicast is an application layer mechanism, uh, and it's specified in the um, remote multicast setup over LoRaWAN um, recommended practice document. Uh, that is defined by uh, the Technical Committee of the LoRa Alliance. Um, and um, uh, as you can see, um, uh, security is, is uh, it's quite important considering multicast. So uh, let's look at the security measures when using multicast. The first, um, there's, uh, the first measure is that there is a limitation on the number of messages you can send in a multicast session. So when setting up a multicast session, you can give a, um, a maximum number of messages uh, that are valid to the end devices. So that means that even if an, is, if an attacker has um, access to the uh, security context of the multicast group, um, there is still a limited number of 
uh, messages that it can send. Uh, another measure is that there is, uh, next to a limited number of messages, there is a limited number of time that um, a multicast session stays active. And this is both uh, valid for class B and class C. So that end devices don't stay in uh, a multicast group forever. For example, if they are in class C multicast group, so they are continuously listening, they draw quite a lot of power from the battery. Uh, and if there was no limit on the number of messages or if there was no timeout uh, on the length of the session, uh, the end device may keep on listening forever until the battery drains. And that, that also relates to security. Um, Another measure is, would be to enforce that all the end devices in the multicast group uh, use a hardware secure module. And a hardware secure module is a little physical uh, key fold on the end device that contains the keys uh, and that are not readable. So the hardware secure module performs security operations with the keys that are in the hardware secure module, but you can never read the keys from the hardware secure module. Um, the way multicast works and the, the exchange of these keys is that there is a multicast key and the multicast key uh, is, is a key you can compare with the network key and the app key so it's, it's a key from which session keys are derived uh, one multicast group has one multicast key so there is a new multicast uh, key for each uh, new multicast group um, but the multicast key is shared uh, with all the devices that are in the multicast group, so it's, that's the same key. But the multicast key is sent encrypted to the end devices. And the multicast key is encrypted with the multicast key encryption key. Um, the multicast key encryption key is a per device lifetime key um, that is shared out of band with the application. So if you deploy for example, streetlights, uh, you would deploy a thousand streetlights in a city. Um, uh, on distribution or on manufacturing, uh, you provision these streetlights with a, a multicast key encryption key, which you use to distribute the multicast key to all these streetlights to make them part of one multicast group. Um, the, for security, the application may only group devices in the multicast group if the application is, uh, is, is sure that the multicast key encryption key uh, is stored in an HSM. So, for example, uh, for security, you may um, create different groups of devices uh, based on different security um, mechanics that these end devices feature. Still, of course, end devices are required to store the decrypted multicast key, so the actual key uh, from which the session keys for the multicast group are derived. Um, end devices, they, they are still required to store this key in an HSM as well. Otherwise, uh, when the multicast key leaks, the whole multicast group becomes insecure. Then let's talk about um, securing deployments. Uh, this is going to be about some red flags um, when deploying solutions, uh, but also how to use uh, joint servers, what a joint server is, uh, and how to provision the root keys. So let's start with, uh, with the red flags. First, um, when you see that ABP is being used, that's, that's just not secure. Uh, the keys cannot be changed. The keys must be shared with the network operator um, end devices need persistent storage, so if there is a power cycle, a uh, solution doesn't work anymore unless the network supports uh, power cycles and that opens the doors for replay attacks. So just in general, ABP is, is not a secure way. Another red flag is obviously when keys are printed uh, and they, or they are sent by email, and we still see that sometimes. Um, keys should not be visible. Uh, they should be in an HSM. Um, because it's impossible to, to send keys uh, in clear by email or in a, by paper uh, in a secure way. Uh, another red flag is the inability to choose a joint server or to be able to operate your own joint server. 
uh, if you're unable to choose a joint server, if you can't operate your own, you have obviously a platform lock-in. Um, also, if you if you don't know the joint server or if you um, uh, don't know anything about the security measures that are taken there, uh, there could be potentially unsafe storage of the root keys of your end device. And the same goes for the application server. So um, application data may get compromised if you don't have any means of control over the application server. Ideally, you can use any application server or you operate your own application server um, using a network server that's operated by a network. It could be a public network or a private network. Uh, another red flag is when the same keys are being used for multiple end devices because end devices they need their own unique set of keys. Finally, a red flag is when an end device uses hard-coded keys somewhere in, in the code, for example. Um, and that's because end devices should use an HSM where the uh, root keys are stored safely. So let's look about let's look at the um, LoRaWAN uh, sec securing deployments uh, in LoRaWAN. When you consider deploying LoRaWAN solutions, uh, make sure that the solutions provider follows the LoRaWAN network reference model uh, and implements the LoRaWAN backend interfaces. So these are relatively new concepts. Uh, they are released as part of the LoRaWAN 1.1 specification and it really uh, specifies the role of a joint server, a network server, and an application server. Because before, these terms were already being used, but the, the roles were not defined clearly, and neither were the interfaces between these. Uh, and since LoRaWAN 1.1, and since the backend interface is 1.0, uh, these are now defined. Um, and this also gives you uh, some, some means to, uh, to see if the network uh, solutions provider um, respects these. So what the joint server does is it generates the session keys from the root keys and it shares these session keys to the network server and the application server that you want to use. So the joint server calculates the session keys and it sends the network session keys to the network server and application session key to the application server that you want to use for that device. Um, it doesn't of course, it doesn't give you the, the root keys because they are uh, not readable. The network server handles the MAC layer uh, and uh, it only works with the network session keys. The application server um, only has access to the application session key for encrypting and decrypting application payload. Another important aspect for uh, industrial deployments, secure industrial deployments is uh, using an end device with uh, a hardware secure module. Uh, the hardware secure module is not only used to store keys securely, but also to perform the LoRaWAN security operations itself. So the hardware secure module uh, should um, implement the LoRaWAN security operations, like calculating a MIC, uh, um, encrypting uh, the join accept, uh, things like that. Um, and this also means that the root keys uh, are not readable and the session keys are also not readable, but they are stored in the HSM. The only thing that comes out, for example, is the MIC um, and the, the plain uh, payloads, for example, for downlink, things like that. Um, what's also important is that the keys are provisioned in a secure way. So key provisioning is, is, a, is a key topic uh, to keep uh, solutions secure end-to-end. Uh, key provisioning can be uh, done by the manufacturer uh, or by the distribu distributor uh, on a joint server. So how does that work? Uh, the LoRaWAN root keys and the session keys, so they are symmetric. Um, but these root keys, they should not be exchanged between the manufacturer or the, the distributor uh, and the joint server. Instead, the way it should work is that the key provisioner of the end device uh, and the joint server that they share a master key um, and in this case the, the end device key provisioner it can be the manufacturer of the hardware secure module of the end device it can also be the manufacturer of the end device uh, it can also be a distributor 
Um, and the master key that is shared between this end device key provisioner and the joint server uh, should not be readable to anyone. It should always be stored in a hardware secure module on both sides. So in the factory or in the distribution facility uh, and in, uh, in the cloud or on premises where uh, the joint server uh, operates. The way it works is that the joint server uh, provider uh, generates a key uh, in, in its hardware secure module, uh, encrypts it with the public key of the end device uh, key provisioners HSM, and then sends that encrypted to the, um, uh, to the key provisioner, and the key provisioner can decrypt it in its HSM, so the symmetric master key in their HSMs. From this master key, uh, and from some per parameters, like, for example, the join UI, the dev UI, and maybe some other parameters, uh, both the uh, key provisioner and the joint server can um, generate the same session keys. This is important, again, because LoRaWAN is symmetric in terms of security. Alternatively, it's a different approach, but also works, um, is that the end device is already pre-provisioned, um, by the same party that operates a joint server just uh, for provisioning. So an end device uh, has uh, some parameters uh, of, the, of the manufacturer of the secure module. And the first time the end device joins, it contacts that joint server. So the, the keys, they stay in the same domain, for example, at the same manufacturer of the, of the hardware secure module. Uh, and then that joint server reprovisions the device to the joint server to use. And that would be uh, a second join uh, that is carried out by the end device um, where the uh, reprovisioning happens online. Uh, this is a procedure that's custom, it's not uh, specified in LoRaWAN. Um, so, um, yeah, it's uh, not too much details for now. Um, but these things are uh, fortunately coming up and um, industrial players in the Lower Alliance are uh, working hard on these security um, uh, issues as, as well as, uh, as the Things Network, of course. So let's have a look at how we um, uh, apply these, all these aspects in the Things Network stack. So the Things Network stack V3 uh, for LoRaWAN follows the network reference model literally. So we have a network server, a joint server, and an application server that really do what they are supposed to do according to the LoRaWAN specification. Uh, we also implement the backend interfaces, so you can use a standalone joint server uh, or um, work with a third-party joint server. Uh, you can use um, the joint server from our stack uh, also uh, in other networks. Uh, and the other way around. You can also use the Things Network uh, network server and application server with a custom trusted third-party joint server. So uh, in V3, um, the joint server stores the root keys and it derives the session keys. Uh, and you can, you can deploy the joint server um, in a cluster V3. So if you run the entire stack, you can also uh, operate a joint server as part of that, but you can also uh, deploy the joint server in a private cloud or on premises. And you can also make it work with any uh, hardware secure module, uh, either hardware or a cloud solution uh, by AWS or by Google Cloud or by Microsoft Azure. Uh, it gives you full control. Um, you can use your own joint server uh, when using a private network or uh, when using the public community network. And this gives you full power also to switch between network operators. So you can start uh, deploying solutions on the public community network with your own joint server. Uh, from there, you can migrate to a private network, still using the same joint server where your keys are. Um, uh, and also, you could also switch from another a network operator to the Things Network uh, using your joint server or the other way around. So that gives you full flexibility. So that's uh, covering security um, in uh, LoRaWAN 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, so I discussed a bit of the security fundamentals, the scope, uh, multicast, 
industrial LoRaWAN deployments, uh, and how we approach security in the Things Network stack. Um, thanks very much for watching.